This disclosure is about the truth. 400,000 documents released by the whistleblowing website WikiLeaks describes torture and abuse of Iraq detainees, including electrocutions and executions. For the first time, we now know most of those killed, 66,000, were unarmed civilians. And a sedan sped toward the patrol and failed to stop after visual signals were given. A shot was fired at the front tire, but the vehicle did not stop. The patrol engaged the vehicle, killing two civilians. When you read about a six-year-old being tortured to death with a drill, when you read about an entire family being wiped out in a split second because some 18-year-old American soldier has decided that the car was going too fast and just opened fire, when you hear about uh, people being locked in a prison for two months and suspended from the ceiling, all these stories are horrific. There uh, is very strong evidence, uh, compelling evidence, uh, of war crimes uh, having been committed by coalition forces. There is uh, over a thousand uh, reports on the uh, torture or abuse uh, of detainees, cases of people uh, trying to commit surrender uh, and being killed uh, in the process of committing surrender. The uh, Assange arrest is uh, scandalous in several respects. Uh, one of them is just the effort of governments, and it's not just the U.S. government. The British are cooperating. Uh, Ecuador, of course, is now cooperating. Uh, the efforts to silence a journalist who was producing materials that people in power didn't want the uh, rascal multitude to know about. Okay, that's basically what happened. It is the role of good journalism to take on powerful abuses. And when powerful abuses are taken on, there is always a back reaction. So we see that controversy um, and we I believe that is a, a good thing to engage in. At the same time that the US government is chasing journalists all over the world. Look, let me tell you something. Be nice. They claim they have extraterritorial reach. <laughs> They have decided that all foreign journalists, which include many of you here, have no protection under the First Amendment in the United States. So that goes to, to, to show the gravity of this case. This sets a dangerous precedent for all media organizations and journalists in Europe and elsewhere around the world. This precedent means that any journalist can be extradited for prosecution in the United States for having published truthful information about the United States. Following the reports of mistreatment at Belmarsh Prison yesterday and again today, he did not look well. And frankly, the treatment is dehumanizing. The fact that he is an afterthought almost twice now this week, uh, proceedings have started without a realization that he was not even yet present. This is not about left or right in politics. We can unite on this. It's a dark force versus us who want justice, transparency, accountability, and truth. We have the momentum with us. Please tell everybody that you know that they have to side with Assange and fight against the extradition. If they tell you, I would rather fight for the environment or against animal cruelty or gender equality, tell them. They are about to take every right away from you. You will not be able to fight for any other cause. We are talking about the fundamentals here. We must fight against the extradition. We must save Julian Assange. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to this webinar hosted by the uh, Don't Extradite Assange campaign. My name is uh, Christian Rapson, the editor of Wikileaks. The topic of our event today is the Iraq war logs. They released by Wikileaks on 22nd of October 2010 of the largest leak in military history. What was published that day was uh, 391,832 field reports from the U.S. military covering all events 
in Iraq up until 2009. It was the diary of the war. Never before had uh, people seen such a detailed evaluation by the military itself on what went on. Wikileaks was working in an alliance with several media at the time. Uh, One of the media partners was the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in London, which put all its efforts and its journalists uh, working on uh, going through these files and mining out stories from it. They produced content for media, including documentaries for Channel 4 and for Al Jazeera, English and Arabic. Uh, other media partners were The Guardian in London, Der Spiegel in Germany, The New York Times in the US, and uh, Le Monde in France, and several others, including Swedish national television. Now, I have two guests here today to uh, talk about uh, this release and uh, the importance of it, both in terms of content and on journalism in, in a broader sense, because never before had uh, such a broad alliance of media from uh, several countries been brought together and worked together on a single project. The stories uh, were very noteworthy. They uh, included such things as previously unreported civilian deaths, which uh, were monitored by the US military but not released uh, publicly. 15,000 deaths were unreported publicly. What uh, were in those files? It included very many events of civilian killings, such as at checkpoints, where uh, I believe 700 uh, events were found, where people were killed at the U.S. checkpoints because the, uh, uh, the people didn't stop too early or driving too fast, according to the estimate of the soldiers. Uh, several things of the nature that I'm sure that my co-panelists here today will mention in their, their talk. Uh, But I would just want to mention before we go ahead that the importance of the Iraq warlock is also uh, noteworthy because they are one of the major foundation of the indictment against uh, Julian Assange, who is now facing 18 counts. 17 of them are based on an archaic legal structure called the Espionage Act, never before used against a journalist. So the case of Julian Assange and the importance to fight uh, uh, against his extradition from the UK to the United States is extremely important, not just on a personal level, but uh, because of the implication it will have for the future of journalism if he is extradited. Now, we will be taking questions later on after I introduce my panelists and give them a few minutes each to to talk. Uh, You can write your questions uh, on the Q&A on the Zoom or or deliver the questions to us via social media where we picked out my colleagues. Now, let me introduce the two panelists, a fine panelists here today, a great journalist. Uh, we have uh, Ian Overton, uh, the investigative journalist who was director of the Bureau of Investigative Journalism back in 2010, where uh, people didn't get much sleep and uh, had to work under extreme time pressure and of course, political pressure because of the uh, animosity that we knew we would be facing from the United States because of this release. Uh, Then we have Chris Woods, uh, a fantastic journalist who was at the Bureau uh, at the time, uh, but uh, moved on uh, and is now, uh, he was a founder of Air Wars, a not-for-profit transparency organization uh, aiming to monitor military activity in war zones and uh, civilians' death. The website is uh, airwars.org. Now, thank you, both of you, for coming here today to this event. Uh, I would like uh, to give uh, you the first word, Ian, uh, to discuss uh, and reflect back on uh, on this eventful time back in 2010. Yeah, in, indeed. A, a decade passes far too quickly. But... Um, so it, it, it was a, a, a remarkable moment, first meeting Julian. I met him at the Frontline Club, where he was being um, interviewed by CNN. And um, I, I think all of this was quite new to Julian, really. He, he, he wasn't that accustomed to the media glare. And uh, um, I arrived, we had a brief chat, and he was straight into an interview with CNN. And the CNN journalist was, was uh, I would say, quite robust. Uh, bordering on even hostile. And Julian, at the end of it, um, came to me and 
he said, I, I think I might need some tips on how to, 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 to handle interviews because he, he didn't feel comfortable. And it struck me that, um, you know, the, 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 what unfolded in the months and, and years later um, was, was probably quite a, 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 a seismic shift in terms of his own experiences. I don't think it was what he was actively seeking in terms of all the exposure that followed. Um, but um, Julian was, was working straight off the back of having come out with the Afghan uh, leaks uh, and, and the logs and that uh, had obviously partnered with The Guardian and another print. Um, but the Bureau, um, it, we quickly established that the Bureau had a, a, an offering uh, where people like Chris and myself had a broadcast background and we could work with uh, WikiLeaks, work with the, the evidence uh, of, of found within the logs um, and um, as, as you articulated, try to do work for broadcast. So we teamed up, it was quite a, a, a sort of an innovative approach in a way, taking a large body of evidence and then uh, putting that out for BBC radio, for Arabic uh, media, for um, dispatches on, on Channel 4. Um, and also we did some of the work for Le Monde website, as well as producing our own um, uh, online content uh, that we were very lucky went on to win an amnesty award. So, I mean, in, in terms of the sort of enormity of it, not only was it the world's largest ever military leak of information, but we were also doing something quite revolutionary, I think, in terms of media output. We were getting out on radio, online, um, uh, broadcast, uh, and in different languages. And so this was, you know, lots and lots of moving blocks. And I was very, very lucky to have people of, of caliber like Chris uh, uh, and others working with me, somebody called James Ball, who I know uh, met some of you may know, uh, and, and others um, who, who were very, very good, amazing journalists, really, who really ran at this, um, understood the, the gravity of what we were doing, the historical importance of what we we're doing. Um, and so um, over the, the forthcoming months and, uh, and well, weeks and months that after Julian agreed to this basic premise that we would lead the charge on broadcast output, um, we, we had this, uh, as you said, sleepless nights, a hive of activity. Um, the, the, the oddity of the fact that the Bureau was broken into uh, a number of times um, uh, and, and the theft of computers therein, uh, where there was never... A, um, a, a suspect uh, that was led towards prison, at least. Um, and um, a, 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 a moment where I had, uh, I was woken up very early one morning with a knock on the door and I went down and uh, uh, somebody I knew in the intelligence services just said to me, yeah, they're looking at you and then ran off, <laughs> which I thought was, was a, strange, uh, a strange awakening. But, but the, the output, um, and we worked very closely with Julian uh, look at, talking about the measures of, of output, what should be redacted, what should not be redacted, the, the ethical duties and the protection of, of civilians, the protection of sources, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of the output what was one element of what we were doing. Obviously, we were doing standard investigative journalism process, triangulating evidence. And then on top of all of that was this remarkable effort to try and transform all this into broadcast. It wasn't just us hammering computers, putting out print, it was making films, it was creating radio, which takes a huge amount of effort uh, and, and output. And um, it is really a testimony to the strengths of the team um, that, that I was lucky to, to bring together, that they produced some, some things that were not only revelatory and absolutely damning and condemning of the US military, um, in that area, but I think have had long-term reverberations. And on a personal level, and I think Chris may attest to this as well, I mean, my life it, since then has very much been dominated by the legacy of the Iraq war logs. I've written a book on global gun violence. I've written a book on suicide bombers, both of which I relied on WikiLeaks evidence for uh, the book. And I currently run a charity which investigates explosive violence use against civilians, of which Iraq and the reverberating impact of the Iraq war on the rest of the Middle East has a fundamental impact. So, I mean, I think, and this is probably a good time for Chris to pop in, but you know, to, to talk about how the, the reverberations of the war logs on a personal level were profound, and I think on a societal level um, have yet to be truly understood. 
Thank you very much, Ian, for that opening. Uh, we'll uh, uh, talk later about maybe the broader implication of the release, but uh, Chris, uh, your original or opening thoughts, go ahead. Thanks, Christian. Yeah, I, I, so, so my background uh, to this was, I, I had uh, actually covered the invasion uh, of Iraq, well, in fact, the build-up to the invasion of Iraq, uh, and, and then had been there for the invasion uh, with the BBC, and then had been back into Iraq almost every year uh, from 2003 onwards. So I had a very deep personal knowledge of the disaster that was the Iraq conflict. And, and as we know, it, the, the war began with a lie, uh, and then was sustained by lies. And uh, in 2010, when we published, the war was still ongoing. Of course, it, it would run for another three years uh, before uh, the US uh, and UK eventually withdrew. Um, we were routinely, as journalists, lied to and misled by the British and American militaries. Uh, to give you an example, I was in Basra in, in the late uh, 2000s um, after British forces had pulled out of that city. And uh, we had managed to get a film crew into Basra. Uh, one of the more extreme factions had got control of the city uh, and they were executing uh, women on the street at the time uh, for showing uh, too much ankle. Um, it was, it was a, uh, you know, they were pushing apart couples who were in mixed Sunni Shia marriages. It was a disaster, actually, the British withdrawal and the Americans and the Iraqi military eventually had to go in and recapture the city. Um, I remember being on the British base. The British would not intervene. They would not stop. And uh, a British uh, military public affairs officer telling us to our face, a panorama team, that everything was fine in Basra, there was no problem. Nobody had any trouble there. And we said, this is ridiculous. We have a team there. We know what's happening. Why are you telling us this? And of course, that was their job. Their job was propaganda. Uh, and so when the Iraq war logs came along, it was immediately apparent what an extraordinary um, a trove of material this was on a current conflict and that that was what was so remarkable about it that would immediately and fundamentally change our understanding of that conflict and uh, there was a moral duty on us as journalists to publish that information to make it available and to change public perceptions around that war and if you look at the caliber of news organizations that that came in on the Iraq war logs, The Guardian, Le Monde, uh, Der Spiegel, Al Jazeera, uh, Channel 4 with dispatches. It was, you know, absolute top caliber. News organizations came in and invested very significantly uh, in that project. And as Ian has talked to, the, what, what the logs contained, I mean, there was so much there were so many stories, we had to simply triage it. We had to, we had to decide which were the most compelling stories that we would go with. What would we focus on that would most illuminate the disaster uh, of this war? Uh, and two that always stood out for me was the, um, the very widespread killing of, of Iraqi civilians by American forces uh, at roadblocks. Uh, so, so basically, as the insurgency began to, to, to gain momentum in Iraq, American troops, they, they were incapable of distinguishing civilians from um, potential suicide bombers, and they were just opening fire on Iraqi civilians, and hundreds died. And all of this had been kept secret. Um, I had experienced it myself. I'd almost been open fire on with my panorama crew going into an American base on one occasion. We knew how trigger happy they were. What we didn't know, was this was systemic. This was a, a, a very profound problem. Uh, and also one that the US military internally was aware of. Uh, they were aware that this was something happening across Iraq, but they weren't responding to it. And putting that in the public domain. Kristen, you mentioned at the beginning about the 16,000 additional deaths. Of course, the Iraq war logs contain details of almost 70,000 civilian deaths. Mm -hmm. Many of those not killed by American and British forces, by the way, they were tracked by the US and Britain um, as the insurgency grew and effectively a civil war had broken out in, in Iraq between Sunni and Shia, which had been stoked by Al-Qaeda in, in the ensuing chaos uh, post-invasion. 
But within those 60,000 deaths in the war logs uh, were 15,000 that Iraq body count had not previously known about. So there were actually far more civilian deaths there. And again, back to this question of lies, we had been repeatedly told by the American military, we don't do body counts. And indeed, that's where the name Iraq body count comes from, of that, that wonderful NGO that to this day still counts civilian deaths in Iraq. Um, and the Iraq war log stripped that veneer away and showed us quite clearly that they had been tracking civilian deaths from the beginning. They had comprehensive data on those deaths. They chose not to reveal that information and chose to claim that they weren't gathering that information. And so um, morally, there were, there'd never in my mind been any doubt that, uh, that it was entirely the right thing for uh, WikiLeaks uh, to make the material available and, and entirely proper for news organizations to, to publish that material. Thank you, Chris. You mentioned uh, the lies and uh, about uh, the documentation of, of the civilian deaths there. Uh, it comes to mind uh, that uh, I was involved in the, the release of the collateral murder video, which shows the killing of uh, a dozen civilians, uh, many of them unarmed. Uh, of course, in the field report, actually on that incident, all the, those who were killed were listed as uh, enemy combatants. Uh, so it was quite difficult, uh, I gather, to, of course, to go through the documents and uh, cipher through because uh, there was this attempt to, uh, uh, to, uh, to put the stamp of, of combatant on every civilian that was killed. Another thing that I want to mention, which I think was uh, a very much a moral blow to the, uh, the, uh, the U.S. military and the British forces in, in Iraq, was the fact that uh, it became known that... Uh, uh, these forces were handing over the de detainees uh, to uh, uh, Iraqi forces where they were then tortured and, uh, and killed. Uh, there was a demand to, the, to basically register all this, but uh, uh, strictly the US forces were forbidden from intervening. Now, how damaging was that? And uh, maybe in a, a, a sense in totality as well, uh, Ian, did this change the, the entire narrative? Did this change the view uh, of, of the entire Iraq invasion rather than a war? Um, I, I was very struck uh, around a year after the logs came out that I'd been invited uh, to, one of, to Kazakhstan to give a, a talk uh, as part of a forum of investigative journalism. And um, Daniel Finkelstein, who is now a member of the House of Lords, who was an FT columnist, was there on the panel. And, and Finkelstein, who, who's a very influential journalist in the UK, said openly, and I, um, th there was nothing new in the Iraq logs. We didn't find anything of any substance or, or, or newness. And, and I've, I really lost my temper. I, I think I may have even sworn. Uh, because I was so offended by this 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 belief that that, that you know, but, and and this was, I think, in a way, a media mantra that particularly came out of the sort of pro-government, pro-military papers that there was nothing new in here, nothing to see, and we should move on and don't cause a fuss. That was the number one, and and I think it was probably a coordinated attempt to try and spike the story. The second thing, which I thought was was quite egregious, was. Um, was this um, way in which uh, the, those media entities who were not part of the consortium um, almost saw it as their moral duty to do whatever they could to try and unpick the validity of our reporting, um, partly through personal attacks on Julian Assange. And Julian, I think, so I, I recall being interviewed for two hours by the New Yorker for a piece they were doing on the Iraq war logs and Julian. And, um, and, and, and I basically said everything that we're probably going to be saying in this podcast of, of, of great detail around the, the, the nature of what we found within there. I went through every single element of, of the big revelations. And then at the very end, she said, well, give me some personal detail on Julian. And I said, well, he was always wearing this leather jacket. I mean, that's all I said. It was a, a pithy sentence thrown away at the end of two hours. And I think I was a bit tired. Anyway, that's the only thing that they included in the interview. And, and, and I saw this time and time again where 
Julian became the story, even though I don't think that he was um, deliberately trying to create that, that environment. And the revelations that we found within the logs uh, were not amplified in the way that I felt they were. And then this later, I think, had, had ultimate uh, an impact in that the government, particularly the, the US government and the UK government's hand was not forced into doing any action. Um, Nick Clegg made uh, a claim at the time that he was going to set up um, an historical allegations investigations unit that was called IHAT. Um, and there was some funding put into this, but I had closed uh, around a year ago with no um, valid prosecutions made. Um, and when I began to investigate I had the International Historical Allegations Team in Iraq, the Iraq, sorry, the Iraq Historical Allegations Team, when I began to interrogate their intent, their capacity and their function, um, I found out that there wasn't one person on this paid staff of IHAT who spoke Arabic, as an example. So the UK government's own historical allegations team in Iraq didn't employ anyone with, who was an Arabist. And I think that that really sums up the, the response to the Iraq war logs. And what, but but at, at the same time though, I do think that there was virtue and valor in what we did, in that we did def uh, create, as Chris has said, um, hard evidence that there was lies and repeated lies by the UK and the US governments. Uh, we showed that the military's uh, in-ground force operations do do body counts. And I think that that has, has molded a lot of the work that Chris and I uh, are involved in now in ensuring that civilians have a, a moral duty for their deaths and injuries to be recorded. And, and, and ultimately, I think that what it showed is that the militaries, when they wage war, are compiling a lot more data than they ever had, had admitted to before. And I think that's a very potent precedent in terms of um, future wars waged. Thank you. Uh, Chris, I have a question here for, from Malcolm Storek. He's asking, uh, do we have a reliable number for civilian deaths in Iraq? Uh, I want to ask, uh, ask this of you, Chris, but also uh, I want to mention, you said this was, at, uh, was released well the, when the Iraq war was still going on. It has been maintained that uh, the, uh, the uh, war log release uh, had an impact to end the presence of U.S. troops in Iraq uh, when the al-Maliki government in Iraq uh, denied uh, the U.S. troops the uh, impunity uh, that they were requesting. So maybe your thoughts on that and the original question about actually the, uh, the, uh, uh, the civilian deaths in the country. The impunity question was certainly uh, key to the Obama administration's decision to withdraw from Iraq. Uh, although I think that was primarily actually driven by um, uh, uh, Eric Prince's uh, mercenary organization, the, the Blacks, uh, I can't remember the name of the organization off the top of my head. He's changed the name so many times, but uh, that had gunned down uh, multiple Iraqi civilians and the outrage uh, over that and the, the fact that they had been given effective immunity was, uh, I think that was a bigger driver. Um, uh, but, but of course the Iraq war logs uh, played into that. In terms of the question of civilian harm, is there a definitive number? It, it really depends you know, how you, you, you count this, how many Iraqi civilians were directly killed by American and British forces. Um, the, the, the most authoritative data on this is uh, still with Iraq body count. Uh, and we are looking at tens, many tens of thousands over the duration of the war. Then of course, there are indirect deaths. I mean, far more Iraqis died in the civil war that was unleashed as a consequence of the invasion, uh, really beginning around 2005, and absolutely atrocious uh, civilian casualties occurred uh, when that Sunni Shia effective civil war began. Uh, and uh, interestingly, the Americans, they, they did in the end intervene in that and, and I think it is fair to say that you know under Petraeus they you know America in the end did choose to pay a blood price to to put troops into those 
communities that were fighting each other uh, as a way of, 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 of ending or, or trying to end that civil war. So I think it's, it's fair to say that having sat on the sidelines for several years, the Americans eventually did intervene and, and very many, very many American soldiers lost their lives as well. Several thousand, I think, died from 2006 through 2010. So, um, and then of course there's the, the, the broader indirect deaths and we knew for many years that, for example, very high infant mortality in Iraq that had uh, preceded the invasion because of the sanctions and then the absolute collapse of uh, Iraqi society and infrastructure that takes place in 2003. And to this day, much of Iraq has, hasn't recovered almost 20 years on from the invasion. So still uh, uh, obscenely high infant mortality, uh, low life expectancy, uh, poor uh, educational outcomes. You know, you look at the city of Mosul today, uh, there's no functioning hospital in Mosul. That's to do with a different war. But again, ISIS would never have happened uh, without the invasion of Iraq. There are so, you know, how far do you want to go in trying to understand the, the desperate impact of that? calamitous decision to invade Iraq. Um, you know, you're looking at hundreds of thousands of deaths overall if you go for that broadest count. Um, so, um, you know, pick your number, I guess. I guess there is a, a, a consensus that, of course, the situation in Iraq uh, uh, did create the uh, uh, breeding ground for ISIS, just in the same way as the bombing of Cambodia by uh, Nixon and Kissinger created the uh, scenario for the Khmer Rouge to uh, uh, come to power and all the atrocities and genocide that were uh, happening in that country. Um, Ian, in, in, in terms of uh, the effect, uh, of course, we had Libya, we've had the involvement in Syria, we had the drone wars, but do you believe that uh, there's a possibility that the release of the Iraq war law, so all the uh, exposition of all the lies uh, in justifying the war and during the war, uh, may have uh, diminished the uh, the uh, desire of of the United States to enter into a conflict of the, on the same scale. Well, um, I, I think that certainly that there is a reticence of um, both the U.S. government as well as the U.K. government putting boots on the ground. Um, the uh, and I think the, the 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 work that again Chris and I are very much involved in in our own way is is analysing the, the the consequence of that decision because what we've seen is is a shift from maybe Humvees on the ground to drones in the air. I think that it's it'll be difficult to say that the drones in the air is a direct consequence of one thing alone. It's advancements in technology. It's um, uh, a, 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 the, the very nature of the wars that are being fought mean that there is a belief by some that targeted killings uh, is more effective uh, when you take out certain uh, Salafist jihadist group leaders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I, I do think that the um, the appetite for boots on the ground uh, was certainly um, eroded to a degree by the revelations that the uh, the, the, the Iraq war logs um, revealed. And ultimately to me, the Iraq, I always go back to this question, and I think this is a very compelling question, when you sit down with members of the, of the military, particularly in the UK, but also in the US, I ask them, you know, about the perception of who's the good guy in all this. Um, and I think that, um, you know, soldiers genuinely believe, generally and genuinely, that they are doing, the, you know, the good thing, that they are not the Nazis of the modern age. And I'm not saying that the US and UK soldiers are, but, you know, the Nazis believe they were the good guys at the time they were doing it. People generally believe in the wars they're fighting that they are doing good. When the great systemic picture is revealed, when repeated incidents of violence are shown, like the deaths of civilians at checkpoints, like the torture of um, detainees in US-run prisons, the, these things become seismic shocks in the body politic. And I think that the U US did not want a, a revisiting of the sins of the Vietnam War. And then they suddenly were, it was revealed in the Iraq war logs that they were doing just the same in Iraq. And whilst it was very difficult 
for the Bureau to secure US broadcast uh, agreements and partnerships. So we weren't able to really spread out the, the content of the Iraq law, war logs in broadcast across the US. I still think that it, it had uh, an impact on the cultural perception of the good of the Iraq war and, and of the Afghan war with the Afghan logs. And certainly when you sit down with senior military um, today and have conversations with them, you know, over coffee about, um, you know, what was what good came out of Iraq, what good came out of Afghanistan, they do pause for thought and they struggle to be able to articulate um, the sacrifices that their soldiers made uh, on the fields. And I think that part of the journalistic uh, compiling of evidence from the Iraq war logs and the triangulation of evidence on the ground as well with the work that people like Chris and myself, we, we've gone out to Iraq independently as journalists and reported therein. That sort of work, I think, combines with the Iraq war logs and has really shown that, the, that our, our intervention in Iraq was not necessarily something that the good guys did and that the reverberations of, our, of the UK's intervention and the US's intervention are still um, unfolding. I mean, I could even, you, I think you could even argue that the recent uh, explosion in Beirut, um, you know, the, the, I've, I've spent a lot of time in Lebanon in recent years, and certainly the reverberations of the conflicts in the whole of the Middle East has impacted Lebanese society in such a way that corruption and, and failure of the, the mechanisms of the state are, are, are you know, are, 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 are second nature there and then you know it, corruption is endemic and you could argue that the entire destabilization of the middle east began with the invasion of iraq and we're seeing its unexpected reverberations even today chris um, uh, maybe i'll ask you to to reflect on the same basic topic uh, but i also have a question from the audience uh, 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 can you discuss what uh, the finding regarding torture yeah, I, I, to torture is, is, is of course, uh, um, uh, uh, shocking. Sorry, we already knew before the Iraq war logs about Abu Ghraib. Uh, again, uh, we would never have known about Abu Ghraib had that material not leaked to a journalist, that the US was torturing, torturing uh, prisoners of war. Uh, and to this day, no, uh, I don't believe a single uh, US uh, service person has been prosecuted for uh, clear breaches of the Geneva Conventions. Clear. And there's, I, I, I can't think of a clearer and better documented case of torture. The, the war logs also, they didn't, there, there was an Abu Ghraib section there, I recall, Ian, uh, thinking back to it, but the, 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 I think there was a higher level of classification than the war logs actually touched on. One of the interesting things about the war logs is that they were primarily the sort of day-to-day -day, uh, communications from and between units. So we didn't, we weren't looking at the high classified stuff, highly classified stuff. We were looking at the, that interaction between units and that helped us to build a much deeper, more comprehensive understanding and one of the things the war logs clearly demonstrated is that US military personnel were observing regularly their Iraqi colleagues torturing prisoners and not only were well, they were reporting it internally but they were not intervening and they were not stopping this and they were not making this public uh, and again the, 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 the public value of having that story in the public domain uh, was critical. You, you, you are obliged as a, as a co-belligerent to report that. You are, you are not complying with international humanitarian law if you don't report that you have observed acts of torture by a partner belligerent. Uh, and again, uh, the, the, the very significant value. I just wanted to mention very briefly here, I, of course the fascinating thing here is that the war logs only reflected what the American military was doing. We've never had the British war logs. And I, 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 as a, 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 you know, as journalists, were a, 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 a data dump to be made available today, showing the British role either in, in the invasion and occupation of Iraq 2003 through, through 11, or 
um, indeed the current UK war against ISIS, where uh, many will know, absurdly the British claim to have killed one civilian in thousands of airstrikes, an, an, an absolutely absurd and false position. In fact, we demonstrated earlier this year at, at Air Wars in a, an investigation with the BBC, even where the American military was finding that British airstrikes had killed civilians, the American military, not us, uh, the British were still saying, no, nope, we're fine, we didn't kill those civilians. So if, if, a, if a data dump of the British campaign became aware uh, available today, either of those campaigns, no journalist, no journalist would turn that down. Uh, and we would welcome the existence of, a, of an organization like WikiLeaks that perhaps facilitated, if that was needed, uh, such information entering into the public domain. This wasn't a one-off. There will always be a need to publish information like this and to hold militaries better to account. Uh, that is the job of journalists. Yeah, and the, 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 the probably implication for of, on journalism uh, in this very broad alliance and cooperation uh, that I think uh, was unheard of before. I think it was quite revolutionary that you could have so many media organizations of uh, different nature in print and broadcast in different countries uh, coordinating. I know actually because I was there that it was not uh, an easy task uh, and actually sharing information. But uh, We've seen these alliances uh, in the last decade now forming on other platforms. Was this a paradigm change in your opinion? Um, the Bureau was very much interested in experimenting with this sort of thing. So we had done quite a, a detailed analysis of European Union structural fund mismanagement. And we tied up with the, we tied up with the Financial Times, uh, Radio 4 and Al Jazeera for that as an experiment. But um, this was bigger, bolder, and yes, I think it, it it showed what was possible. But as you, I think, alluded to, it also showed the, the great complexities and challenges in collaborations. Um, I think some people were not used to that kind of collaborative work, and they were more aligned towards pursuing their own goals. Um, there were tensions inherent. Um, we had one uh, very... Uh, um, awkward moment where one of the partners um, broadcast an hour before everyone else because they got the timing wrong and they didn't realize we were on UK summertime. Uh, and, and these were just uh, annoyances that actually, I think because everyone was under stress, they were felt very fiercely and, you know, te emotions and tensions ran high. And it was, you know, I, I can't deny it was an incredibly stressful uh, collaborative um, approach. The thing which I've found um, more um, challenging though, uh, ultimately from this, is that I, I had hoped that some of the collaborative partners in that would have maybe given more support to the current situation that Julian finds himself in. And I've been, I think, quite disappointed that some people who, you know, did work closely with Julian uh, over the Iraq war logs and are now seeing the situation that Julian finds himself in which is directly linked to the Iraq war logs, are not really being a vocal supporter. And I, and, and, and I wish that I had a greater platform to really, uh, you know, be a cheerleader for, uh, um, you know, the protection of whistleblowers, the protection of sources, and the fact that, you know, the, the, the great sin in all of this um, was, um, you know, in, in many ways, the actions of, you know, U.S. soldiers to civilians. You know, Julian is not, um, I guess, the criminal in this. The criminal was the torturous and murderous behavior of some soldiers in the ground on in Iraq. And of course, you know, war is hell. Soldiers will behave appallingly. That is the nature of wars as the beast. But accountability has been lost in this. And so, you know, in the demand for accountability for Julian from the US government at the moment, um, what I would say in the counter response is, where is the US government's uh, willingness to hold any sense of accountability, as Chris has mentioned, to those perpetrators of, of, of you know, violent war crimes, uh, which we saw unfold in Iraq and the evidence is there in black and white. Chris, your reflection on the same topic, and maybe I'll include a question here. Uh, I'm being asked here by um, the audience. 
uh, if the Bureau, the Guardian, or the New York Times would get a trove of information directly, as, as was published in 2010, would they dare to uh, publish it, uh, giving the uh, uh, response now from the Trump administration and the indictment against Julian Assange? I think yes is the answer. I think I think if if, if an equivalent became um, um, uh, available today, but we we would probably see a similar partnership emerge. I, I suspect. I don't think a, one single news organisation would, would necessarily take the risk of publishing, and that was a, a part of what this was about. It was about multiple news organizations coming together and shouldering the responsibility of doing the due diligence of saying to the world this is so important that we put aside our rivalries and are presenting to this this to you in, in you know it, 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 across multiple platforms multiple rivals uh, and and i think you would see similar i don't think news organizations would be cowed per se uh, and, you know, the, the, the Trump administration has its challenges, but let's not forget the Obama administration was pretty ferocious in pursuing investigative journalists and uh, those who'd received um, uh, leaked government information uh, 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 as well. So this, is, this isn't a left-right issue. This is, a, this is an issue of, of government and, and governance, I think. And... Um, I, I, I think we have to um, bear that in mind. I, I, I just, the, the, the question of, I mean, Ian mentioned about, you know, his book citing, I, I just don't think we can ever underestimate the value of the broader um, uh, leaks. Uh, I published a book a, a, a few years back on the history of armed drones, and I think I cited WikiLeaks 200 times in that book. It was an academic book. 200 times clear, straightforward citations um, where what had been revealed, not just Iraq, that was Afghanistan, that was Yemen, that was Pakistan, that was uh, US uh, uh, behavior uh, bugging the UN and, and all sorts of stuff that we, we had found through um, uh, the leaks. And I think also worth, worth um, saying and just following up on, on, on Ian's point, you know, the reported source of this material has already paid a desperately terrible price and continues to pay a desperately terrible price, Chelsea Manning. And um, they've already pursued Chelsea brutally and continue to do so today, as, as I'm sure folk know. This is, a, this is an attempt by the US with the collusion of the British to push upstream responsibility for the leak. And if they come for WikiLeaks at this time, is it gonna be ICIJ next for the Panama leaks? Um, or is it they're just gonna go for the source next time? They're gonna go for the Guardian. You know, it matters. This really matters. Uh, whatever individual uh, feelings people might have around Julian or what Le WikiLeaks has done at different times, this is a fundamental issue defend Julian, defend WikiLeaks, because if, if the US secures a prosecution here, um, that sets a terrible and, and dangerous precedent that has profound implications across the entire news establishment. Um, never mind the individual injustice that would be visited on Julian, because once, you know, God forbid that Julian is swallowed up by the uh, US federal criminal system, um, really, I, I don't see a chance of any fair trial there. Having looked at how people are, are pulled into that system on federal indictments um, uh, and, uh, you know, the UN Special Rapporteur has, has described this as cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, I mean, effectively, you go into that US criminal justice system and you're your, your, your punishment begins on day one. There's no, there's no remand in, in the US system. You're in isolation, you're constantly at the mercy of intelligence agencies, you can endlessly question you, you're, you're, you've got almost no access to your lawyers, you're in, you're, it's, it's true incarceration before you ever set foot in a court uh, and, 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 and face actual charges. It is a desperately challenging situation and, and um, you know, one that we should be 
uh, aware of as well. So I, I don't, I, I simply don't think it's possible for there to be a fair trial, uh, but there shouldn't be a trial. I mean, that's really the point here. There should not be a trial and the British government should not uh, be colluding in uh, attempts to extradite Julian into the uh, federal criminal justice system of the United States. It simply should not. Oh, and and, and I would also suggest as well that one of the, um, I mean, if you if you look at the 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 justification for the extradition of Julian, um, then the question is as well, um, to, to where does the buck then stop? I mean, should should the editors who accepted the Iraq war logs data be guilty of the same thing that Julian um, is being accused of? So should I? present myself at the US Embassy for extradition? Should Alan Rusbridger be considered guilty for handling stolen data? I mean, at what point, you know, are, are the culpability issue, I think is, is, is problematic. And I think, you know, arguably, um, you know, if we don't stop, if it, doesn't, if, it, if it doesn't stop with Julian, then where does it go next? And I think Chris is absolutely right. The precedent of this is chilling and, um, and unexplored. And my, my feeling is that the, the, the British government, so willing, particularly in a kind of a Brexit environment, to have close friendships with the US, will do whatever it takes to try and uh, get Julian over there. And uh, the, the lawyers who will be valiantly fighting for Julian to stay in the UK and not be extradited, um, well, you know, let's hope that they succeed. But precedents could be set here that would be, I think, uh, as as potent uh, and as concerning as what we found in the war logs in many ways. Well, on that point, uh, I've got a question here from uh, uh, to all both of you panelists here. Uh, it uh, says recently BBC broadcasted a documentary called "Once Upon a Time in Iraq," where they discussed uh, the killings and torture of civilians by U.S. military. How is it for BBC fine showing it yet, Mr. Assange is being prosecuted for it. I, 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 I just if, to jump in there. I, I, I think the, the, the framing by the US here is to sort of, uh, to, to, you know, WikiLeaks was founded by and, ru and is run by investigative journalists, but the US government has always tried to frame WikiLeaks as a sort of not really a journalistic organization as a sort of front or a, a sort of conduit and i think that's how they're sort of trying to frame this so uh would they go for the bbc absolutely not and of course that exceptional series that's on the bbc at the moment for those who haven't seen it um you know is very heavily informed by uh, the, uh, the iraq war logs by the way um but they're, they're attempting to sort of hive off WikiLeaks and, and suggest that WikiLeaks is somehow different. Um, but it's not. You know, it, it, was, it was a publisher. It was a, it was a journalistic organisation providing a critical public function. Um, and uh, again, as Ian says, far too few journalists in the UK standing up on this. Uh, every newspaper, every news magazine, every uh, news organisation should be uh, very publicly uh, challenging this uh, and pushing back hard against the attempt to extradite you. Well, Ian, how can we uh, uh, secure that this, uh, this goes ahead? I mean, you, you both seem uh, agreeing on the fact that uh, the UK journalists, uh, where the battle is now in the UK courts, uh, is being uh, is being fought. Uh, how can we get uh, uh, journalists in the United Kingdom to actually take a stand and and care that this is about them, as much as it's about uh, Julian Assange? It's about the future of journalism, and uh, is there a chance to actually uh, put a pressure on politicians uh, because this is a, a political persecution? There is no doubt about it. Well, um, I mean. The, the, the fundamental challenge, and, and, and you know, Chris and I, again, we both run separate organizations that lobby for the protection of civilians in conflict. But the problem is, is that you know, the, the, the money and lobbying and advocacy available for the protection of individuals who either are whistleblowers or seeking to protect civilians in conflict, et cetera, you know, either our, us ourselves or, or, or the, the people we're lobbying and advocating for, 
there's precious little money uh, for, for, for this sort of, um, so there's not really an ecosystem of advocacy. There's a, there's a huge ecosystem, you know, in, in the, 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 the arms trade. There are lots of arms lobbyists and arms manufacturers, but you know, those on the other side of the coin who would articulate for peace and protection of civilians aren't funded. And I think that this has a reverberation in terms of, um, you know, a, a, the civil society is not geared up in a way to protect individuals like Julian. I mean, I, you know, I've seen the Pen International and hopefully English Pen could be more vocal and we should could we could be getting more writers and 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 commentators supporting Julian. And I'd love to see Pen International and English Pen engage more on that. I think, as Chris has said, we should be hearing far more from journalists in the mainstream media uh, articulating why this is a profoundly dangerous precedent to be set. Um, as as I've, I've, I've often considered as a kind of a trick, uh, as a kind of a, 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 an act of theater to present myself at the US Embassy as an editor of an organization that handled the Iraq war logs saying that I should be extradited if Julian is to be, um, because I do think it is as serious as the allegations, uh, you know, uh, this is such a serious issue that the democracy itself is a threat here and the right for freedom of expression. So, um, I mean, I think, I think that the, the, the big challenge, as I've said, is, you know, there's, there's no coordination possibly of this, or there needs to be greater coordination and advocacy and, ad and lobbying. And, you know, uh, of course, during a time of COVID, people's, people are distracted. And of course, each day ticks towards, you know, Julian's trial date, where, and people are, you know, obviously much more interested in infection rates. So th that is another blow towards the oxygen of publicity. Uh, I don't have an easy answer, but I think that, you know, it, it hopes that people watching this, um, you know, and I will speak out and I'm sure Chris will as well, whenever we're asked to, but, um, you know, the, 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 the coordination of this possibly re relies in many ways on, on you, Christian, but know that you are supported by those who were intimately involved in the leaks um, at the time. I, th I think that I think there is one practical thing that maybe we could do, um, and, and you know, as, because we are approaching the tenth anniversary of of uh, the the Iraq war logs, and and clearly, you know, the 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 the, the original group of news organisations that worked together, we've drifted. Different news organisations took different lines. The Guardian, in the end, were quite a strong anti WikiLeaks position, or rather, a strong Julian position eventually but 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 perhaps there is an opportunity to bring back together all of those news organizations and have them collectively assert the value and importance of the iraq war logs which let's remind ourselves is part of uh, julian's extradition paperwork it's cited in his paperwork and i think that would send a strong signal actually if those major news organizations would come back together and, and reassert the critical importance uh, and the moral imperative that we had to publish, uh, the fact that we did uh, practice due diligence, um, and that a decade on, the, the historic value of the leaks uh, has uh, stood completely. Uh, not, a, not, a, not a single pushback that I'm aware of on anything that we revealed uh, 10 years ago. Uh, nothing has really changed my understanding or worldview in, in the following decade of what we revealed at the time. We added uh, to the public realm. And I, I think that is something we could perhaps do, um, is, is, is maybe bring back together those original partners for a strong public statement. Uh, may, maybe we could get um, um, those, those partners back here, yeah, I don't know. Mm. It's a good idea. I'll, I'll write to, uh, to to Vintner. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll write to Rusbridger and suggest that maybe he could lead the way. Very good idea. Thank you. Uh, I was asked to how is Julian Assange, uh, and uh, that is uh, uh, well. I can I can answer that one. Yesterday in the uh, management hearing, uh, it was revealed that our recent psychiatric evaluation has uh, shown that his health has deteriorated. Uh, quite substantially over the last few weeks and no wonder he has been locked in now without any visitation from his family, his children, 
He's not even seen his lawyer uh, for now five months. Uh, it also emerged in the management hearing yesterday that uh, the U.S. Uh, uh, Justice Department uh, under Attorney General Barr is doing their, their utmost to derail the, uh, the hearing that was, is planned for September 7th by introducing a totally new uh, uh, or brushed-over document to, uh, uh, at this last minute, which of course should be considered a travesty of, of justice uh, to uh, such, an, such a late stage. But uh, before I let you go, before we end here, can I get your thoughts about the possibility, you are a seasoned UK journalist, uh, and of course you know the justice system in the UK better than I do. Is there a chance for Julian Assange to win this in, in, in uh, uh, this round in magistrate court, in your opinion? Um, I, I think we've seen in, in the past some cases of extradition being shocking and people were extradited. And then sometimes the, the, the role of the die was such that um, they weren't. I think the issue here um, may lie within political will. Um, and, you know, as, as um, I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm continually struck by the fact that our offices were repeatedly broke into uh, when we were doing the investigation and that I was informed by a very trusted contact that I was being heavily investigated myself. So, you know, the mechanisms of the, uh, the intelligence services in this country were intimately involved, as far as I could see, in um, sending out strong messages of either disruption or intimidation in relation to the uh, Iraq war logs. The UK government is not a friend of Mr. Assange. The UK government is not a friend of the WikiLeaks. And largely speaking, the UK government was not very friendly to the Bureau. And, um, and, and as Chris has said, you know, we, we, we've, we've, we've shown that governments are repeated liars in this environment. Will political intent and uh, intelligence security claims of national security bend the law? Um, it wouldn't be unheard of. Um, and unfortunately, in the time of, of, of now, given, as you said, how Julian is being treated uh, in prison, um, and, you know, there, there was no leniency in relation to COVID, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think that he is a political pawn. And I obviously am hopeful that the UK justice system will prevail. But um, I wouldn't be surprised if it doesn't. We have a little time left, Chris. Your final thoughts on this I, topic? Perhaps there's some hope. I, I, I would say that the, 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 the English criminal justice system has, has sometimes been wary of extraditing UK citizens into the US criminal justice system. And I think if a, if a case, if we can cut through the political nature of this deportation, this attempted deportation or, or, or extradition, and make the point, first of all, the moral case, and secondly, uh, that uh, it would result in, in Julian's uh, cruel and unusual punishment, which is entirely unlawful. It isn't, it, you cannot do that to somebody. Uh, I, I, that may yet, with the right tailwind, uh, sway a magistrate. It has happened before in the UK and perhaps, perhaps it may happen again, but more voices need to be heard. More people need to be sp uh, speaking up and there needs to be, there's, there's, that needs to be public. Uh, you, you know, it's great to have this discourse today. I want to also be reading, you know, editorials in the Telegraph um, uh, and the Daily Mail defending Assange here because they need to, they need to. Indeed, Chris, more voices need to be heard. Uh, I want to thank you, Chris Woods, for this, this hour and thank you, Ian Overton. It was a great pleasure to have you on this event today. Uh, Let's hope that we are a continuation of discussion about the importance of the Iraq war, as, as you mentioned. Uh, for you, all of you who were watching this, this will be available, of course, online afterwards. Thank you for watching uh, this live broadcast on the, uh, on the internet. Uh, and please support the, uh, the campaign, the Don't Extradite campaign, Don't Extradite Assange campaign. 
uh, visit uh, donatjadasans.com website and uh, take part in that very important struggle to uh, avert this uh, disaster, not just for an individual, but for the future of journalism. Thank you.